So the topic for today is intestinal polyps and uh, colorectal carcinoma. Uh, so we'll start with intestinal polyps. Uh, so first, we need to know what a polyp is. A uh, polyp is any circumscribed tumor that or growth that is above the mucosal membrane. So when you look at the endoscopy like this, this is the mucosal membrane. So anything that projects above is a polyp. A polyp can be a neoplastic polyp or a non-neoplastic polyp. So based on the attachment of the polyp, uh, it is classified into sessile polyp and pedunculated polyp. A uh, sessile polyp will be like this. So it will have a broad-based attachment. A pedunculated uh, polyp will be attached to the intestinal wall with the stalk. So the word sessile comes from plas. So plas it is sessile directly at the stem without a stalk. So that's where the word comes from. This is a sessile polyp and this is a pedunculated polyp. Uh, based on the histology, uh, you can have mucosal polyps and submucosal polyps. So this is the histology of the colon. Uh, so here you see the mucosa, and this is the muscularis mucosae, this is submucosa, and this is the muscularis propria. So a polyp can arise either from the mucosa or it can arise from the submucosa. So uh, under mucosal polyps, we have epithelial polyps that uh, can be further categorized into serrated lesions and conventional adenoma. You have amatomatous polyps and inflammatory polyps. Submucosal polyps uh, can be anything that you know, arises in the submucosa. So lipomas can occur, lymphoid aggregates can occur, carcinoids can occur. So these we won't be dealing with uh, in detail. We will be focusing primarily on mucosal polyps. So first we have the epithelial polyps. Under epithelial polyps, we'll deal with serrated lesions. So serrated polyps of colon rectum can be classified into hyperplastic polyps traditional serrated adenomas and sessile serrated adenomas are polyps. This has been renamed now, now it's called sessile serrated lesions because most of them are flat and not polypholytic. Uh, hyperplastic polyps are by far the most common polyps and they can occur in the distal colon or rectum. Uh, traditional serrated adenomas are least common and they usually occur in the distal colon and sessile serrated lesions occur in the proximal colon. So what does serrated mean? So this is the night edge, the night edge serrated when you see these bumps. So like that, the serrated polyps also will have multiple serration. So coming to hyperplastic polyp, uh, so the theory uh, about why a hyperplastic polyp occurs is like this. So um, first, uh, it is a normal crypt. So this is a crypt of a colon. Uh, in the normal crypt, the proliferation occurs in this region. So that is the base. So here the cells proliferate and as they move up, but in hyperplastic polyp, what happens is this proliferation zone is expanded. Okay. So there is more proliferation and there is less apoptosis of the cells as they occur, uh, as they progress towards the surface. So as because of that, there is more cells in this space. So that causes it to wrinkle like this. And that's why uh, there is serrations in hyperplastic polyp. Uh, hyperplastic polyps, uh, both the seven, so I told hyperplastic polyps are the most common uh, serrated polyps, right? So the most common, so they are, uh, account for more than 75% of serrated polyps, and they usually occur in older age group. Uh, grossly, you will see a small dome shaped uh, polyp over here. And I already told you that they're more common in distal colon and rectum, and they usually assist and what you need to know is a hyperplastic polyp has no malignant potential. So if you have a, a hyperplastic polyp, you don't have to follow up the patient long term. Uh, so microscopically, you see these well-formed elongated glands in it, and there is serrations. You can see that there is irregularity over here. But this serrations will be more towards the surface. It will not extend towards the base. And there will be no significant cytological atypia, and the architecture of the crypts will be more or less retained. Coming to sessile serrated adenoma polyp, it used to be called, and now it's called sessile serrated lesion. Uh, this is a precancerous lesion. So, as I told you, it's called sessile serrated lesion because it is no longer, it, it, most of the lesions tend to be flat like this. And uh, this is more common in the proximal colon. And uh, uh, there is some. Um, uh, this is a pre-malignant condition. So if you have a sessile serrated lesion, you have to follow up the uh, patient. Uh, if you look at the features of a sessile serrated uh, uh, there will be distortion of the architecture. 
So I told you in hyperplastic forms, there is no distortion of architecture. The architecture is more or less retained. But here there will be distorted and dilated architecture. And towards the base, it will be boot shaped like this. And uh, in hyperplastic folder, the serrations were limited to the upper part of the crypt. Here it will be, the serrations will extend till the base of the crypt. And uh, um, usually um, the proliferation center in hyperplastic polyp, I told you, it will be look. It was. It is located in the base, ex except that it is extended. Here, the proliferation center will be located abnormally away from the base. So these are examples of uh, cell serration. Uh, here, the serration is coming towards the base, and here the architecture is kind of distorted. You don't see the tube pattern that you normally see, and you can see the boot-shaped architecture over here. Yeah. Yeah, here also. Is everyone able to hear me? It's an interaction of some state. I can hear you, ma'am. Okay, all right. So, uh, if you see a SSL serrated lesion, you have to note whether there is dysplasia or not. Because here I've given that usually there is uh, no cytological dysplasia. So you have to look for dysplasia because if dysplasia is, a, I told you, SSL serrated lesion is a pre-malignant condition. So if you have dysplasia and a SSL serrated lesion, you are more likely to, uh, like uh, the patient is more likely to develop a malignancy. Uh, coming to traditional adenoma, this is also a precancerous lesion and it's a least common one. It's usually seen in the distal colon. Unlike SSL serrated lesion, it will likely be protuberant. And then there will be a complex architecture to this microscopically. So you will think that it is an adenoma. So let's look at the features over here. So if you see a complex architecture over here, right? So it will kind of look like a villous adenoma, but you have to be careful and look for serration. Uh, there are the, uh, the important feature that you see in traditional serrated adenoma is ectopic crypts. So you in this picture, if you see, you see one crypt over here. Within a crypt, you see multiple crypts. So ectopic crypts are a feature of traditional serrated adenoma. And the individual cell morphology also will be distinct. There will be elongated cells, and they will have this pencilate nuclei, long, thin nuclei. This is also a feature of traditional serrated adenoma. Traditional serrated adenoma is also something that requires follow-up. So this is just an overview of the serrated polyps. You have hyperplastic polyps, the cell serrated polyps, and traditional serrated polyps. Hyperplastic polyps. If you if if you um, get a report that says hyperplastic polyp, you don't have to worry. You don't have to follow up the patient. But the cell serrated lesions and traditional serrated polyps, you need to follow up the patient. Okay. Next, uh, we finish the epithelial polyps. We'll come to the hamartomatous polyp. So, can uh, someone tell me what a hamartoma is? Hello? Okay. So, hematomas are basically uh, abnormal proliferation of endogenous tissue, right? So, there's benign mal malformation of tissue elements, but it will be disorganized proliferation. Uh, and hematomatous polyps can occur sporadically or they can be component of genetic syndrome. Hematomatous polyps can be classified into juvenile polyps, huge sugar polyps, uh, Cowden syndrome, uh, and polyps that are part of Cowden syndrome and Cronkite Canada syndrome. Okay. Uh, coming to juvenile polyps. So, juvenile polyps can either occur sporadically or they can occur as part of juvenile polyposis syndrome. Okay. So when do you call something a juvenile polyposis syndrome? When there are more than five juvenile polyps of the colon and rectum, there are juvenile polyps throughout the entire GIT. And uh, if, there, if the patient has a family history of juvenile polyps, if there is juvenile polyposis syndrome, it is associated with a lot of extra, intest extra intestinal manifestations. There can be congenital anomalies, there can be ganglioneuromas, pulmonary AV mal malformations. So a lot of extra intestinal 
uh, manifestation. So you have to watch out for. So a juvenile polyp commonly occurs in children, uh, but it can occur in adults, but it commonly occurs in children. And it usually occurs in the rectum. If it is only a juvenile polyp, if it is not a part of juvenile polyposis syndrome, it is usually solitary. Okay, And because it occurs in the rectum, it commonly manifests as bleeding. So a patient will have hematochesia. Uh, and uh, because it can pull the rectum downwards and can cause rectal prolapse and intersection. Uh, juvenile, uh, it is usually associated with mutations in BMPRI and SMAD4. Uh, if usually, if it occurs, if it occurs, so if only a solitary juvenile polyp is there, it does not require follow up. And uh, there is uh, no malignant potential. So, you only need to remove it if it is symptomatic. Uh, so, this the grossly, they usually pedunculated polyp. And they have a smooth glistening surface and reddish to tan cut surface. Uh, cut section, you see multiple tortuous dilated strips as well as mucus secreting glands. But the intervening stroma is important. It's usually edematous and there are a lot of inflammatory cells in the, in the intervening stroma. This is important. I'll tell you why later on. Coming to pure sugar polyp, it is also a hematomatous lesion. It's usually seen in the stomach, small intestine and colon. Uh, solitarily, it usually does not occur. So, uh, it usually occurs as a part of Peutz-Jäger syndrome. Uh, Peutz-Jäger syndrome is an uh, autosomal dominant syndrome and usually you see this hematomatous polyp in the GI. Apart from that, you see mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation. Uh, usually, it occurs due to a germline mutation in the STK11 LKP1 uh, and there is increased risk of other cancers also. So, the risk of GI tumors is 2 to 10%. The risk of non-GI tumors are also there, so they get can get breast cancers, they can get pancreatic cancers, stomach cancers, ovarian cancers. So this is the diagnostic criteria for Peutz-Jäger syndrome, and it's usually associated with a lot of extra intestinal manifestation. And you can see mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation like this. Uh, so grossly, it can be sessile polyp or pedunculated polyp. Microscopically, you can see a central core of smooth muscle like this. And there is an arbor arborizing pattern. So arborizing means like tree-like pattern with heaped up epithelium. Uh, the intervening stroma you have to pay attention to because in, I said in juvenile polyp, it is highly inflamed with granulation tissue. But here it is just smooth muscle tissue without inflammatory cells. Uh, coming to Cowden syndrome. Cowden disease, I, I think you know, is due to P10 mutation and you get numerous hematomatous polyps uh, along with lipomas and ganglioneuromas of the intestine. And there are a lot of extra intestinal manifestation also. Um, uh, there, are uh, the, there can be some benign lesions in the skin. Apart from that, you get tumors of the breast, endometrium and thyroid. Uh, Cronkite Canada syndrome is a non-hereditary syndrome and uh, the polyps re resemble juvenile polyps. Uh, so the intervening stroma obviously will be inflamed, but they have other features also. So they get alopecia, they get nail atrophy, and they also get skin hyperpigmentation. Coming to inflammatory polyps, uh, so we finished polyp, we finished uh, uh, hematomatous polyp and this is inflammatory polyp. Uh, inflammatory polyps, uh, they are non-neoplastic and they are usually due to uh, inflammation. Anything that causes inflammation like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, all of this can cause inflammatory polyps. Okay. So, uh, we finished anti-polyp-related lesions. We finished hematomatous polyps, we finished inflammatory polyps. Now, coming to neoplastic polyps, neoplastic polyps are generally adenomas. So, here, there will be dysplastic clonal proliferation of colonic epithelium and it's usually in the, uh, it can be anywhere in the left colon, the right colon, the rectum. So morphologically, they're classified into tubular, tubulovillus and villus. Like serrated lesions, uh, adenomas are also pre-malignant. So tubular adenoma, so it's very easy to remember how you can say something tubular, tubulovillus or villus. Uh, in tubular uh, adenoma, the tubular morphology should be more than 75%. In villus adenoma, the villus morphology should be more than 75%. Anything in between is tubular villus. 
So these are tubules. These are tubules. So uh, if more than seventy five percent of these tubules are there, then it's called a tubular adenoma. Tubular. If you have a tubular adenoma, it is good because the malignant. I mean, it's relatively good. Uh, the malignant potential is only around five percent. Villus adenoma is the worst kind of adenoma. So it is most common in the rectum, and as I said, the villus architecture should be more than seventy five percent. Um, see, you can see multiple villi over here. So villus adenoma is the worst kind of adenoma because the malignant potential is the maximum. So you have forty percent uh, malignant potential in villus adenoma. So in between. So that's also most common in rectum, and it has both tubular morphology and villus morphology, and it has a malignant potential also in between the two. So it's around twenty two percent. So when you find an adenoma, you have to look for dysplasia because again, in serrated lesions also we look for dysplasia. In adenomas also we have to look for dysplasia, and dysplasia can be classified into low grade dysplasia and high grade dysplasia. So in low grade dysplasia, this is the peak of low grade dysplasia. The polarity of the cells is relatively maintained. Uh, there is mild nuclear atypia. Some increase in mitosis will be there, but it will not extend till the tip. That is, it won't extend till the luminal surface. This is this is a this is a picture of high grade dysplasia. So you can see the difference here. Here the morphology is relatively, the architecture is relatively maintained, the polarity is maintained. But over here you can see like multiple complex architecture, and you can see the cells showing lot of loss of polarity, and mitosis will be increased and it will extend till the lumen, and you can see a lot of atypical mitotic figures also. So this adenomatous polyp can also occur as part of a syndrome. Uh, so that is called adenomatous polyposis syndrome. So uh, this occurs due to mutation in the APC gene, and it is an autosomal dominant syndrome. And it, uh, the APC gene is located in chromosome five. So this is the diagnostic criteria for familial adeno adenomatous polyposis. Uh, there are usually more than hundred colorectal polyps. Or you have to find a germline mutation. You have to do the test and find a germline mutation in APC. Or you can have a family history of APC, and you can have any number of adenomas at a young age. So these, uh, there is a. If you have FAP, you have a hundred percent chance of getting colorectal adenocarcinomas, which is why screening in these patients is very important. So this is just to uh, remind you. This is from your neoplasia chapter. In uh, Robbins, uh, so this is APC. If you, if you remember, is a tumor suppressor gene. Okay, so when there is uh, WNT signaling, um, beta catenin. Usually, the normal function of uh, beta uh, APC is to hold back the beta catenin in the cytoplasm and prevent it from going into the nucleus. Okay, uh, when WNT is uh, uh, signaling happens, this uh, APC releases the beta catenin. Uh, beta catenin goes into the nucleus. It activates a transcription factor (PCF), which is responsible for, which uh, helps in progression of the cell cycle. Okay, when uh, APC is mutated, it is a loss of function mutation. So APC no longer holds back beta catenin. So constitutively, this pathway gets activated. So beta catenin does nothing stopping from beta catenin from going into the nucleus. So it, it does go into the nucleus, activates PCF, and the cell cycle progresses unchecked. So these are the components of FAP. Uh, you can get uh, polyps all over the GIT. You can get uh, colorectal col polyps in stomach. Fundig gland polyps will be seen, and in duodenum also you get adenomatous polyps. In the liver you get hepatoblastoma, and biliary tree also you get dysplasia and adenocarcinoma. Apart from that, there are extra intestinal manifestations of uh, FAP. So those have specific names called Gardner syndrome and Turcot syndrome. So Gardner syndrome. Uh, are associated with a lot of other things like fibromas, osteo uh, uh, osteomas, uh, the hyperplastic retinal epithelium, desmoid tumors, epidermoid cysts. So usually, like skin and soft tissue manifestation. Uh, in uh, Turcot syndrome, it's associated with medulloblastoma. So it has CNS manifestation. There's something called attenuated FAP. Uh, where there is less severe presentation, so there's later presentation. There will be lower number of polyps, uh, and uh, there is less risk of colorectal carcinoma. Also, there's also something called MUTYH-associated polyposis, 
uh, where it will present like attenuated FAP, but it is an autosomal recessive condition. And uh, the risk of colorectal carcinoma is also around 75%. So I told you that FAP, if you have FAP, you have 100% chance of getting colorectal carcinoma. So screening is very important if a person is diagnosed with FAP. So the at-risk family members should be screened and they should be offered genetic testing. And they should be, um, colonoscopy should be done from the age of 10 to 12 years and repeated every year. So at 20 years, if there are no polyps in a patient, person with FAP, then you can continue screening till five years, until 50 years. Then if there is no polyp, then probably he does not have the genetic mutation because if there is FAP, definitely by the, at least by the age of 50, he would have developed polyp. Okay, so we are done with polyps. Coming to carcinoma colon. Um, okay. So CA colon is responsible for nearly 10% of the cancer deaths worldwide. And in, in the etiology of uh, CA colon, usually it's associated with low intake of fiber and high intake of carbohydrates and fat. So generally, all this alters your gut flora. And when there is altered gut flora, they produce a lot of, and uh, they, they cause a lot of oxidative damage to the surrounding epithelium. So that they postulate that that is why uh, the diet plays an important role in uh, causing colorectal carcinoma. Uh, so maybe that's why uh, colorectal carcinoma is more common in the West. So this is the picture from the WHO. If you look, uh, you can see that the Western half of the hemisphere is relatively darker in compared to the Eastern half. So colorectal carcinoma is more common in the West, but the instance is kind of right, rising in the East now. So coming to the pathogenesis, uh, pathogenesis, it can, it can be under... Uh, um, four headings, chromosomal instability, microsatellite instability. This is more important in MUTY which is a polyposis, so we won't be dealing with this. And then CPG island methylation pathway. So under chromosomal instability, so usually in this under chromosomal instability, there will be mutations, actual mutations in the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So from your neoplasia chapter, you can, you will know APC, beta catenin, BRAF, SMAD4, P10, P53. So there will be mutations in the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor gene. And uh, if this happens germline, you can get FAP and its variants. You can get juvenile polyposis syndrome. So when there is germline mutation of APC, you will get FAP. If you get germline mutation of SMAD4, then you'll get juvenile polyposis syndrome. So uh, this is the adenoma carcinoma sequence that is there in your organs. So you know, when you sh this is a normal colon, and then when there is uh, the first hit, then that is becomes mucosa at risk. And then when there is the second hit in APC, then you get adenomas. And then they further acquire many things like K many mutations in KRAS, TP53, SMAT2, SMAT4. And then many genes get mutated and it becomes carcinoma. Then coming to microsatellite instability pathway. So uh, my, what a microsatellite is, it is, it is a repetitive DNA sequence that uh, usually occurs at multiple, like, um, like GC, 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 multiple times it will be repeated. Usually it is repeated five to 50 times. Uh, so normally during replication, because it is repeated so many times, this uh, microsatellite is a site where commonly replicative errors can occur. So during replication, there can be some uh, C will be replaced by a T or something like that. So this at this site, uh, replicative errors are more likely to occur. And when it occurs, it is corrected by the mismatch repair pathway. So um, this mismatch uh, repair mechanism corrects the replicative error. So the genes that are involved in mismatch repair are MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. Uh, so when there is mutation in this mismatch repair pathway, you are more likely to get a mutation in the microsatellite. So that is why there is microsatellite instability. Uh, so um, there is a syndrome called Lynch syndrome. Uh, in Lynch syndrome, they will have germline mutation in the uh, mismatch repair mechanism. So they are more likely to get tumors by the microsatellite instability pathway. So this is adenoma carcinoma sequence in the microsatellite instability pathway. 
So in a normal colon, you get mutations uh, after you get mutations in MLH1, MSH2, PMS1, uh, and uh, MSH6. Uh, in this case, you don't get uh, your tubular adenoma, tubular villus adenoma, all that. You get serrated lesions. So serrated lesions are the precursor to carcinomas in the microsatellite instability causes. So once you get uh, serrated lesions, uh, then they acquire more further mutations and it becomes a carcinoma. So if there is a carcinoma, you suspect repair uh, mutation. Uh, you can uh, you can find that out by immunohistochemistry. So uh, usually there is loss. Uh, normally it should stain like this brown color but then when there is mutation there will be loss of expression of these proteins uh, so um, here you can see the control this is the normal cells all normal cells should be positive for these because normal cells will have a working mismatch repair protein but in this tumor the mismatch repair protein is not working so it uh, it is not expressed so it will become negative Uh, this is uh, CPG island uh, methylation. So, um, okay. So, CPG island is usually a promoter. So, this is a gene and this is a promoter. Okay. Uh, I think you can remember from your epigenetics if there is methylation of something, it will get suppressed. Okay. So, when there is methylation of the CPG island, then the CPG island is, a promote, is in the promoter region, right? So, there will be suppression in the promoter region. So the gene will not get expressed. So in this way, uh, the there will be um, the mismatch repair genes. The there will be no mutations in the mismatch repair genes by themselves, but there will be methylation of the promoter. So the mismatch repair genes will not get expressed. So there will be microsatellite unstable colon cancer, but there will be no mutation in the DNA of the mismatch repair enzyme. So this uh, commonly the mismatch repair gene that is uh, mutated is MLH1. So that promoter region gets hypermethylated. So the MLH1 expression is reduced. And so the function of MLH1 is reduced. So there will be microsatellite instability. Associated with this, commonly you get also BRAF mutation. So we'll briefly talk about Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is an autosomal dominant syndrome. Uh, it is more common than FAP. So uh, the average age is around 20 to 30 and the average age of colorectal carcinoma is 30 to 40. This occurs due to mutation in the mismatch repair genes. And uh, there will be 80% lifetime risk of colorectal carcinoma, but there will also be other risk of other carcinomas, especially endometrial carcinomas. Apart from that, you get ovarian carcinomas, pancreatic carcinomas, biliary tract carcinomas, urethral carcinomas. So for diagnosis of HNPCC, there's something called Amsterdam criteria. So, um, so basically it is a one, two, three rule. So, uh, or three, two, one rule. You need to have three affected relatives with histologically verified adenocarcinoma of the large bowel. Uh, and these three relatives should be in two successive generations of a family. And one of them should be diagnosed before the age of 50 years. You have to exclude FAP and the tumors you have to verify by pathological examination. Uh, in modified Amsterdam criteria, uh, it is the same as Amsterdam, uh, but then the, uh, except the cancer must be associated with, uh, it can be associated with any of the HNPCC cancers like endometrium, small bowel, ureter, renal pelvis, and not necessarily colon cancer. Coming to morphology of uh, colonic carcinomas. Uh, so this is an, a picture from the WHO. Here you can see an ulcer. Okay, I think you'll know the difference between a benign and a malignant ulcer in the graph. So here you can see that there are everted margins over here. So an everted margin is usually seen in a malignant ulcer. So this is a cross section of the same everted margin that you see. So this is the everted margin and this is the base of the ulcer over here. Here you can see that there is some whitish lesion and you can see the whitish lesion is going into the submucosa over here. So this is a tumor that is invading up to the submucosa. This is a muscularis layer that seems to be intact. Okay. So there is a difference between right-sided colonic cancer and left-sided colonic cancer. In right-sided colonic cancer, generally they present as polyps. 
So it will be arise only from one wall of the intestine and it will grow in a polypoidal manner like this. Okay. Uh, the importance I'll tell you later. Uh, left sided, uh, I mean, it's not absolute. Uh, left sided coronary cancer tends to grow circumferentially usually. So you can have it here. See here, there is thickening of the wall over here, the thickening over here. And you can see overall uh, narrowing of the lumen. So this is like a napkin ring. So it is basically, it is constricting the lumen of the entire colon. Uh, coming to microscopy, uh, it is similar to, generally similar to adenocarcinomas of any size. So it can be well differentiated or it can be poorly differentiated. When it is well differentiated, you see glands like this. When it's poorly differentiated, you will not be able to make out the, uh, it, it will be quite very different from the parent tissue. When it's well differentiated, it will be kind of similar to the parent tissue. That's why you're seeing glands over here. Here you see she cells. There'll be, there'll be no identity to the cells inside. Uh, in coronic cancer, generally within the lumen, you tend to see a lot of necrotic debris. Uh, apart from this, there are certain variant morphologies, like sometimes you can see a lot of mucin. So here, uh, grossly, you see like a lot of excellent mucin over here. Here also you see mucin. Okay. So when you see the mucin disappearance, then generally these tumors tend to have a poorer prognosis. And this is a signet ring appearance. So the signet ring appearance is not as common in colon cancer as it is in your stomach gastric cancer. But uh, I just put it uh, because this is also associated with poorer prognosis. So this is a signet ring. So basically, there is a ring and there is like a thickening at the corner. So the cells also kind of look like that. Uh, there is a vacuole and the nucleus is pushed to the periphery of the cell. Um, clinical features of colorectal cancer. So I told you that in right-sided colon cancer, usually they present polypoidal. There is no circumferential narrowing of the wall. So generally, these, uh, these tumors cause obstruction pretty late on in the disease. So initially, the, um, the symptoms that you see will be fatigue and weakness, and that is due to iron deficiency anemia. So what Robin says is the dictum is if you see iron deficiency anemia in an older man or a postmenopausal woman, you generally have to rule out GI cancer. Left-sided colon cancer, because they uh, cause circumferential narrowing, they're more likely to cause obstructive symptoms. And so, and uh, also they're pretty uh, close to the anal uh, um, orifice. So you can cause uh, bleeding, it can cause change in the bowel habits, it can cause cramping. So left-sided colon cancer are more likely to be symptomatic, whereas right-sided colon cancers tend to be insidious. So, um, this is okay. So this is the staging of colon cancer. Uh, you don't need to know a lot. So basically, um, you know, I think you're aware of the TNM staging. Uh, T T stands for tumor. So this is the tumor proper. Uh, N stands for lymph nodes, and M stands for metastasis. Uh, in all the um, in the GI tract entirely, the T will be uh, determined by the depth of invasion of the tumor. So this is T1. T1, the, tum uh, the tumor will in invade the submucosa only. In T2, the tumor will invade the muscularis propria. In T3, it will invade through the muscularis propria. Uh, in T4, it will breach the visceral pyramid of the C. Okay. So uh, coming to reach the lymph node, that you can also, it can, that's also classified into N0, N1, and N2. Uh, one thing that is important that you have to notice, uh, when we get a specimen uh, of colon, or a resection specimen of colon, we have to find at least 12 lymph nodes. We have to see at least 12 lymph nodes under the microscopes before uh, we can say that uh, the, there, are, there is no lymph node involvement. So it is important for a surgeon to adequately dissect the fat around the colon and give us adequate number of lymph nodes. Because um, I told you that there are uh, histological subtypes that are associated with poor prognosis and all. But by far the most important factors that are affecting the prognosis are the depth of invasion and the lymph node involvement. So it is important for us to examine adequate number of lymph nodes before we call, say that the patient does not have any regional lymph node metastasis. 
by coming to m criteria um, uh, the tumors of the colon most commonly go to the liver because um, the colon is commonly drained by the portal uh, drainage so the portal drainage first goes to the liver so commonly uh, colonic cancers metastasize to the liver apart from that it can go to the lung it can go to the uh, it can go to bones it can go anywhere but most commonly it goes to the liver Uh, the five-year survival rate uh, varies, but overall it's not good. So overall, five-year survival in the United States is sixty-five percent. Here, it's around thirty to forty percent. In Africa, it's very low. So whatever it is, um, colon cancer is not something that um, better to avoid getting colon cancer because basically it is a dismal tumor to have. So I think you should uh, all have your fruits and veg. Thank you. Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. What is the difference between Sushma is asking? What is the difference between grading and staging? So um, uh, that is a very interesting question. Uh, grading is something we do microscopically. So uh, grading is basically how well differentiated a tumor is. So when we say that a tumor is well differentiated, uh, it means that it most commonly uh, resembles a normal tissue. Like a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma is more likely to produce keratin, like a normal squamous epithelium. Whereas a poorly differentiated squamous uh, cell carcinoma will lose all the identity of the original tumor, and it will be just like a bunch of poorly differentiated cells. Similarly, a well differentiated adenocarcinoma will form glands like a normal colonic line, which forms glands. But uh, poorly differentiated again will lose all the identity of a parent tissue. Staging is basically how much a uh, tumor has progressed in its course. So how how much it has invaded, how much it has metastasized, that is staging. Is that clear? Uh, Ma'am, uh, just one small follow up question, if I may ask. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Ma'am, so if it's poorly differentiated, is that a mm -hmm. better prognosis or is a uh, highly no, differentiated. No. Generally, a well differentiated tumor is considered to be a better prognosis uh, than a poorly differentiated one. But uh, there is a lot of confounding factors to that. So basically, staging is uh, very important. How much a tumor has progressed is very important. Uh, grading is also important, and by which a well differentiated tumor will generally tend to perform better than a poorly differentiated uh, Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.